thank you, Sally, for the invitation to come here. Uh, it's good to get out of Melbourne and see the world after, after last year. Uh, welcome to everybody else this morning. Um, so, as Sally said, uh, I've been working on the blowfly and uh, I'm much more a lab-based person and I'm much more a lab-based talk today that you're going to hear rather than a few of the more applied speakers later. So hopefully um, you'll enjoy this little bit of something different to, to start us off. So I'm going to talk to you about a number of different areas that we're looking at to try and understand a lot more about, um, I guess, the, the pest that most people in the room will have heard about, the sheep blowfly. Um, I'm not going to go too much into the background of it. I think most people will know it causes hundreds of millions of dollars worth of damage to production each year and costs a lot to control. Um, there's a lot of animal welfare issues associated with trying to control the blowfly and there's also issues with having to use a lot of chemicals, which brings about things like resistance that I'll also talk about. Um, but uh, we take this pest into the lab and are starting to really try and understand, I guess, what its weaknesses might be and what some new ways to try and control it um, could come from that. So I'm going to talk about um, some of the genomics work that's already been, um, been done and that we're really relying on as a blueprint um, for our work. Uh, I'll talk about blowfly population genetics, which is the, the maggot and adult blowfly samples that we've been collecting and, and having a lot of uh, support from growers in helping us to collect uh, in different areas around Australia. Um, I'll talk about some of the research we're doing looking at early stage fly strike or myasis and um, where we're hoping to try and understand a bit more about what the response of sheep are to a f an early fly strike and also what the maggots are doing on the sheep um, to actually initiate and help themselves uh, remain there and develop. And in the end, I'll talk about some of the functional genomics that we're trying to apply to what we're finding to really understand which of the, the different aspects of the blowfly biology might be the best way to, to target future control strategies. So a lot, of the, a lot of the strategies that we're trying to use against the blowfly are against early life stages, um, which is when it's doing the majority of its damage. Um, so we have here the blowfly general life cycle, which does vary with, with temperature. Um, however, the females lay eggs on sheep after a protein feed. The eggs then hatch and go through several larval molts. So after they hatch at first instar, they crawl down through the wool and fleece, eating a little bit of protein along the way, getting to the skin, and then it's these other later instars that are doing a lot of the damage to the sheep by braiding and then obviously feeding. Uh, they drop off into the soil and pupate. Um, some uh, conditions allow them to pupate and stay in the soil over winter, which is why they're able to hang around, and then they can then come out and the whole cycle then begins again. So we're hoping to really break down um, this early stage of their development to try and uh, stop them from creating the damage. Uh, but we're also looking at some other ways to apply technologies to maybe go about controlling the populations as well. So one of the key things to actually begin working on uh, any organism is to know what genes it's got, uh, which is really uh, the blueprint that we can use to try and identify genes that might be of interest and what sort of biological pathways are actually underway when uh, the flies are attacking the sheep. So a key part of this has been assembling and improving the blowfly genome. In 2015, um, funding from AWI helped establish the initial blowfly genome and that's been published. And we've also uh, ended up improving on that initial genome and uh, in 2018, and we've been using that current draft of the genome, which we've called Freeze 2, um, to perform the analysis I'm going to talk about today. So we have um, predictions of the genes that are within the blowfly now, and so there's around about uh, 12,933 genes, 
These have been looked at using expression data so that we know that they're being expressed in the fly, which is good support that they're real. So, of course, you start off with a lot of computational work and it ends up needing to be validated biologically. So a lot of initial work is predictions of what might be there and we're uh, working our way through trying to validate which ones of those are accurate predictions. And the other interesting thing is that there are still genes within the blowfly that nothing's known about and they're not seen in any other organism. So these could be interesting ways to specifically target the blowfly um, and so we're also looking at those. So once we've got the blueprint, blueprint of the blowfly, we can actually really get stuck into looking at a number of different areas. So we can map genes, so if there's any particular things like a resistance or a gene of interest out there, we can look at mapping those. We can investigate different biological pathways using comparisons to known gene functions from many other organisms, so we don't have to find it all out from scratch. Uh, some of the areas that we're looking at are host detection, so I'll talk a little bit about some olfactory work that we're doing, uh, and also obviously parasitism is the main focus of our, our work. And we also are able to use this for the genetic manipulation of the blowfly. So really this is, this is key um, data that we're able to then use for all of the other aspects of the work I'm going to talk about today. So. The blowfly population genetic study is, is examining how the blowflies are varying in their genomic sequence across the country. It's going to give us an absolute tonne of data, which is great, um, but the important things that we're wanting to try and understand are which fly populations are actually interbreeding, um, how far a fly is moving around, and do they move between particular areas, are they isolated populations, and this has applied reason, reasoning behind it because we'd really like to understand if resistance arose, where might that spread? How quickly might it spread and which populations are under, under threat? We can look at regions of the genome of the blowfly that are under selection. So whether there's pressure for them to adapt to their host or adapt to their environment or to adapt to things like insecticide application. We can look at the genome of these different populations of flies and understand whether there's genes of interest that we should be looking at uh, in particular places, because as I mentioned, there's thousands of genes, so knowing which one we're looking for um, and mapping it down to that region is, is something that this allows us to do. So where have we been sampling? So in 2018-19 and 2019-20, uh, we ran the first couple of collections, and there's another one currently running at the moment, and it's at the moment, the analysis has been done for the initial two rounds of collections, so I'm not talking about today's one where kits are still going out. I've got a few in the car if anyone does at the end of this want to collect some maggots for us. Um, so we've collected from around about 40 sites, 111 samples so far that we've looked at, and in quite a, a number of different states, although um, you'll notice the green dots here are this year's collections, and so really this year has been the, the first time we've been able to get a good look at uh, mid and, and northern New South Wales heading up towards Queensland. We've actually got a few more sites around there in Queensland as well. Um, a lot of that, I think, has been due to climate. The first two seasons was pretty dry and a lot of people didn't have flies around, which is great, and we wouldn't wish that upon anyone, but anyone that has had flies, we've been uh, very grateful at receiving samples from. So the samples we've been collecting have been caught both in traps, so Lucy traps, um, which some people may be familiar with. They smell really bad and they attract the flies. They smell like a chemical dead sheep. Um, and the great thing about these is you can just stick them on a post and um, it'll collect a whole tonne of adults. And for our genetic variation, getting the individual adults from a field population is a, a great way to get a snapshot of the variation that's there. We've also been focusing on getting some maggot samples, and these are just collected off the backs of sheep into tubes with some vermiculite in them to sort of mimic the soil. And that has allowed a, a much wider sampling and greater number of sites than would have been otherwise possible with the Lucy traps. And the other information this gives us is we know that the flies or the maggots that are in there are actually the ones that are attacking sheep. And so we can have a look at if there's a particular set of variants of genes within those, um, those samples versus the, the adults that just are around to try and understand whether there's a, a, a particular strain out there that is more likely to strike sheep. And 
we also have a greater potential of detecting any resistance because these are obviously on sheep and a lot of cases the sheep have been treated at some point. So once we get the samples in, we identify the species from these samples using a number of morphological markers, mainly bristle types, and so um, two of the species that I will mention today, Lacilia sericata and Caprina, um, are very difficult to, to tell apart, so it comes down to the microscope and picking out different numbers of hairs. And so um, we sort of have to push through all of those thousands of flies, which is a lot of fun, and we do get a few students involved in that. Um, so it's important though that when we're putting these flies through the genomic analysis that we, we know what's going in. And so um, after the flies have been morphologically identified, we then um, perform this um, dart seek, or um, it's, at a, it's a company, Diversity Arrays Technology, and basically they're able to examine a whole range of variation at different sites, so thousands of sites. Here we've got 26,000 sites that have been uh, checked and, and have variation between the samples that we've sent in. And so on this heat map here, um, this is all a comparison of our samples to each other, so a pairwise comparison. Um, you can see the red line here is the um, ones compared to themselves, so they're identical. Um, in the yellow are ones that are fairly similar, and as you head towards green, they're very different. And so these green ones here are the Lacilia, Lacilia sericata flies and the yellow and red are the Caprina flies. So this allows us to uh, pull our DNA from those flies and um, that's when we send it to um, have whole genome sequencing performed. So once we get this variation, we're able to have a look at a number of different things. One of those is where are the flies or how related are the flies to each other? And so um, the populations of the different flies we've got here a neighbour joining tree, and I've marked out, so we have populations from Tasmania, populations of Victoria, New South Wales and South Australia, um, some populations from Western Australia, and then this one over here I don't want to focus too much on, it's an urban population of blowflies from Queensland, um, but we're, we're having a look at those for some other reasons, but um, we also have a rural population from Queensland, but we're, we're hoping to get a few more of those. But the interesting thing here is that when you look at how similar the flies are to each other within the samples we've got, we are getting them clustering together in their, in their states, although we're finding that Victoria, New South Wales and South Australia are all basically one large population. And um, this, is, this is consistent with a number of different sort of analysis that we're performing. Uh, another one here is looking at the dissimilarity between the, uh, the flies and we can see that if they're closer together, they're more similar to each other. And again, we're seeing Victoria, South Australia, and New South Wales really all clustering together, indicating that they're quite a, a broad population rather than distinct ones in each state, like we're seeing for the Tasmanian, which you'd expect to be separated, and the West Australian, where they may have in fact been a, a new uh, invasion of the, of the country when they were established in the first place. So we have our... Uh, predicted sort of populations at the moment. As I said, we'll, we'll sort of ignore the Brisbane flies today. Um, but what we do need from our data this year is to try and fill in the gaps there because I've got this Queensland population on the line of there because it was just far enough apart that uh, it may in fact uh, separate out. And so hopefully these additional samples that we've got this year are going to allow us to fill in those gaps and try and understand um, whether it's one population, which is obviously quite a large area for the flies to be um, uh, interbreeding within and migrating through. So when we're looking at the genes, we're also able to compare between different species. And so I mentioned the Caprina and Sericata. Um, the Caprina is, is the main culprit. It's often reported as being about 90% of the fly strike cases in Australia. Um, however, Sericata can also cause miasis. It's not really recognised in Australia for this so much, um, but it is the major sheep blowfly in other countries and across in Europe. And in T Tasmania, we actually identified a large number. So the predominant fly being collected at a lot of the sheep properties was actually Sericata. And so um, we're really wanting to understand how important it is in terms of fly strike down there. And that has a lot of flow through impacts on things like if we're going to look at particular genes and proteins, 
uh, we're going to need to make sure that they're actually the same and doing the same thing in this species as well as in the caprina if it's going to control both at the same time. So we're using maggot samples from Tasmania to try and identify whether sericata is actually present on sheep. So is it striking them or is it just about? And um, having a look at assembling a genome for that uh, from the Tasmanian flies to assist with our comparisons and conducting similar population analysis. So when we've got the variation data, we can also look at more specific things like individual genes. And so the sequencing data that we've got we're looking for known resistance mutations. So this is changes in particular proteins that an insecticide will target that are known to be associated with a resistance to those compounds. And so if we know what the insecticide mode of action is, um, and because the targets are often well conserved, we can compare things that have been found in many different insects. So insecticides aren't just used on, on the blowfly. A lot of the time, a class will be used across a broad way, range of insect species. And so if something's been found in terms of a resistance mutation in a moth or another species, we can look at that same gene in the blowfly and see whether there's been any changes that might indicate that there is a change also being selected for there. So we've compared resistance mutations for a number of different classes of insecticide, including the spinosins, so things like extinosad, neonicotinoids, and things like Avenge and macrocyclic lactones. So for those, and, and this is not an ad, these are just nice pictures of the, uh, of the products. Um, they're not sponsoring any of this work. But uh, we're also looking at some of the more historically used insecticides to look for signatures of selection. And this can help us to understand how flies might have moved around as well. Um, so things like diazinon and dieldrin. So just to give you an idea of what we're, what we're looking for, we can take all of our different um, sequencing data, uh, align it to what we think should be the, be the right, um, be the protein sequence in this particular change here. G137 is important when it changes to an aspartic acid, it leads to diazinon resistance. Um, and it's because the, the, one of the activities of this particular ROP1 enzyme is, is changed so that it acquires and again, a phosphate hydrolase activity, and so that leads to it being able to degrade the insecticide. Now, it's known that this came at a cost, so this is a historical resistance, and there's detrimental fitness effects when they have this change. A lot of, a lot of insecticide resistance does come with some kind of cost. Um, and it would have been lost over time, so we would have expected that this compound's not really being used anymore. Um, however, it's still present in most of the over-the-field collected strains. And this is due to a modifier mutation that's been reported where this actually switches it back and resolves the fitness effects of the mutation. And so we're having a look at what that modifier mutation might actually be as well. Um, but we can do this for any of the different uh, insecticides where we know what the target is. Uh, and luckily at this stage, there's no known resistance to, uh, no target site changes that would be known to confer resistance to any of the uh, these other chemicals here, spinosad and, and the like. Um, uh, but we did find those historical ones. So at least we know things are kind of working that we're able to pick up the resistances that we did expect to be out in those field populations. The only caveat with this type of analysis is that we don't know the targets. We can't look for what the changes would be. So the targets for dicyclonal or ceromazin are not known. Um, we know kind of what they do, but we don't actually know the protein that they're binding to and causing an effect with. And so we can't look at that in this sequence data set. Now resistance to these has been reported um, from a number of different sites uh, across the country from a, a field survey that was done by New South Wales DPI. And so if the resistance mechanism is found from those flies or from further studies, we'll be able to go back and re-examine the data um, to look whether there's any of these uh, mutations floating around in the populations that we do have um, data from. So I'll move on to talking about how we're looking at the early stages of fly strike and what we want to try and find out there. So a lot of the um, early efforts at trying to understand ways to potentially develop a vaccine uh, against fly strike were performed pre-2000 and technology's come a long way. And a lot of those efforts would have been limited um, in the way that they didn't know 
all of the different proteins that were present. They weren't always able to identify um, particular responses. And so we're now able to really dissect the blowfly biology and also better understand the uh, complete sheep sort of immune responses that are happening to blowfly infections. And so hopefully by gaining a bit more insight into these areas, we're going to be able to better inform the selection of vaccine candidates that could then go into um, some sort of trials. So this is putting together genomics. Um, we're also looking at proteomics, so studying what proteins the blowfly larvae are um, excreting at the sheep on the, on the wound site, uh, obviously some histology, and we're also comparing uh, breed strike resource flock sheep with uh, non-selected sheep. And um, again, what we're doing is focusing on this early stage of the fly development. So to get this profile, uh, what we did was we ran a small trial with 14 sheep where we were implanting uh, embryos, so these are blowfly embryos, on a couple of cotton plugs that have been wet and they're implanted onto a site on the sheep. So we did multiple, multiple sites per, if you're asleep, you're not now. Uh, so we put these on multiple sites across the, the back of the sheep and let them develop um, overnight. And then what, the next day we came back and we were collecting different stages of their development. So that as they were crawling through the fleece, uh, when they'd got down to the skin and also when they just started scraping away. And so we were collecting samples of both larval excretions, also the skin exudate that was coming from any slight wounds off the sheep, uh, and also took biopsies at the end of the, um, end of the trial. And so we're starting to profile what the response is, both of the sheep uh, and of the flies at that particular time point. So we took our samples, extracted the protein, and then we analysed that on uh, a mass spec um, which is just a way to identify different peptides that are present. We can then match that back to the genome and try and look at, well, what's, what's going on when there's a wound site versus when there's not a wound site um, and come up with um, some proteins that are changing when the sheep is actually being wounded. And we're starting to look at what sort of biological pathways these proteins are involved in. So we're getting a much clearer picture of how the sheep are actually responding um, to the insult from the, from the maggots. We're also using a, a similar approach of putting the, the blowfly proteins through this system and having a look at which ones are actually being excreted by the larvae. And so which ones are excreted as they're moving towards the wound, but then more importantly, which ones are actually present at the wound. So which ones are going to be visible to any sort of immune response that might be elicited from the sheep. So that process is going to give us a lot of different candidates. Um, and one of the important things that we'd like to do then is really understand, well, what are those candidates doing? Not all of the functions are going to be known. Uh, and for some of those where we do know the function, we're not actually going to know how important that is for the blowfly development. And so we need to be able to have some tools to really interrogate those unknown gene functions and to identify the genes and validate that they're actually required for the development of the maggots and their survival um, on the sheep. Because it's not that easy for the maggots to survive. They do need it to be a particularly moist environment. Um, they're pretty fussy at times. And so uh, if we can disrupt certain elements of their feeding, um, that may well lead to um, them not really um, surviving very well. So to understand which genes are important, we need to work out what happens when they're impacted. So we've got our bioinformatic analysis and we've identified they're there, but we really want to be able to have a technique where we can take that gene away and say, well, is the fly able to survive? And so we, we try and disrupt or um, cause the function of the gene to be lost in some way. And so the way um, we can do this is by knocking out genes. Um, I'm just going to go through an example of um, how we knocked out or validated this technique using um, a gene called white, uh, which is involved in the fly's eye colour. Um, and we've also knocked out another gene I'll briefly mention later, orco. When it's knocked out, the flies are not able to detect odorants. So how do we do this? I'll just quickly, a lot of people will have talked about CRISPR or heard about CRISPR and genome editing. 
And so we're able to use this relatively um, straightforward uh, in terms of what you need to do, not always straightforward in actually getting it to work, um, but, it, but it is fairly simple and it's very specific and it only requires two elements. Basically, it needs some molecular scissors, so a protein that's able to cleave the DNA and also something to guide it to where you want to cut. So these are called sgRNAs and these sequences uh, bind to the, or integrate it into the protein complex and help guide it to a specific site on the DNA which can then be cut. So because we've got the genome, we can work out where we want to cut the DNA and then we can use that information to develop um, the sequences for these guides so we get um, to knock out the things that we need to. So for the example I'm going through, we had the white gene that we found in the genome and we found um, a couple of sites that we were able to get this protein to go to and had predicted that we would delete this particular region of the gene. By doing so, it'll lose its function and we should see the loss of the pigment, that red pigment in their eyes. And so the um, Cas9 is guided to those sites and we're able to micro-inject those into the blowfly embryos and we could actually see even in those embryos that were injected um, that we had had some patches of white tissue present in their eyes. So this is not necessarily heritable, um, this is just some of the cells of the fly. What we're really looking for is changes in their germline um, and so um, we have to breed those a bit longer to get that. Um, however, we're able to identify flies that ended up losing the function of this gene. So now we have a technique refined, we're able to engineer deletions in genes that we'd be interested in looking at. And I did mention that one of the other ones currently knocked out is called ORCO, which is an odorant receptor, or odorant co-receptor, so it's actually required for all of the different um, odorant detection of the blowfly. And so we're asking a few questions about the um, role of olfaction in blowfly detection of the host both in the larvae and in the adults, uh, trying to identify which specific other odorant receptors are involved in these responses. And uh, this is a, a project that's actually funded by the um, Australian Research Council um, because it's a much more uh, basic biology, um, but it's one example of where we can take some of the things that we are finding and, and use them in other areas of research. Um, and so we're hoping to identify different gene expansions in the blowfly that we can start knocking out receptors and understand, well, how does that associate with different behaviours of the fly? And so you can see that um, this is some maggot work where we're getting um, attraction to particular compounds in our flies that can detect odour and those that can't um, aren't attracted to those particular odours. And so in other species, there's um, a lot of work that's been done on the different receptors and what things are attractive or not. And so we can use some of that data to predict which genes we might be more interested in looking at. So where to next with um, this strategy? We're hoping that we'll be able to improve our ability to manipulate the flies. And one of the things that's important is to be able to do this in a sort of tissue specific way. Um, because we know that for something like uh, an immune response, there's only going to be particular tissues of the fly that are going to be exposed to that. So things like the gut um, and the outside of the flies. And um, we need to be able to investigate a number of gene of interest. So we need this to be a higher throughput system. Um, so it takes a bit less work to actually get through the big list of proteins that we are finding. And um, we need to be able to come up with a system where we can deal with things that are going to die when they're homozygous. So we can't just create a fly that has a knockout of a gene uh, and keep it in the lab easily because a lot of the proteins that we want to look at are actually ones that lead to the flies dying um, because they're the ones that we're, we're most interested in. And so uh, we need to come up with ways to um, look at those. The other thing is that a lot of the proteins that we're interested in are in gene families. And so the question comes up as to, do you need to get rid of the whole gene family? So all of the different proteins that are being produced or just the one, is it, is it something that you can look at specifically? And so uh, we need to be able to delete large tracts of the genome as well. And we're working on that um, down the track. Something else that would be useful is if we do find a protein that we want to actually use or develop further as a, as a control agent, then we need to be able to tag it and potentially purify it so that we've got the native antigen to use in, in that work. 
And there's other applications beyond things like uh, looking at uh, vaccine candidates here. Uh, other things we can do is consider whether there's a, a spot for this in area-wide control strategies, um, but that's something that combined with the population genetics will be um, able to be uh, looked at later. So just to summarise, um, in the blowfly genomic space, we're going to keep on building the data that we're getting into this resource, and really it is critical um, to have as clear a picture of what genes are present and what the differences are. Our population genetics study uh, is tracking towards a nice model that will enable us to, to really look at blowfly movement around those different areas and uh, understand whether or not things like um, a resistance outbreak in um, the New South Wales population would need to be uh, considered on a broader context than just um, local farms and whether there's ways to actually integrate that into some of the management strategies. Um, so we know that there's distinct populations uh, in WA and Tasmania, and so we really need to make sure that all of the candidates we're looking at... Sorry? Um, and so, um, so it's important that we know that any of the proteins that we're looking at are actually going to be effective across all of the different populations and, as I mentioned, potentially against um, closely related species. And so we're looking at the uh, genomic variation of all of those very carefully and um, hopefully those uh, 2021 uh, collections will resolve some of the questions we've got about the rural Queensland populations and how related they are to um, their southern neighbours. In terms of the miasis, we're, we're still um, building our understanding of the sheep response and uh, we're going to keep looking at some of the proteins, hopefully um, progressing some of those through to some of the validation steps. And on the functional genomics side of things, um, we're still working on these techniques that are going to help us dissect the function and the importance of those genes and um, we're going to use those to validate new targets and we've got a couple of students working in this area already um, to look at some of the, the gene families that we think might be important in their parasitic cycle. So um, there's a lot of work that's gone into all of that. Um, and so at the moment, the, the main project team on the population genetics work, the proteomics work, uh, is Dr. Claire Anstead and Vern Bowles from the Faculty of Veterinary Sciences at Melbourne University. Uh, and then we also have a wonderful postdoc, Shilpa Kapoor, who's done a lot of the population analysis. Uh, and a research assistant, uh, Tina Yang, who uh, has been working very hard with all of the samples that have been coming in and assisting with the identification and preparation of those. Um, the population genetics work and the proteomics is largely funded by Australian Wool Innovation and uh, I mentioned the Australian Research Council funding uh, some of the olfactory work that we do. And a whole range of other people are working uh, really hard and have worked in the past on some of the data that we've got. Uh, and there's also a lot of resources that people have um, assisted uh, the project with, including all of the sample collectors out there. So thank you for listening. OK, so we do have time for questions. We've got a couple of questions over here. We're going to have a used to use a, used to use a roving mic because we're recording. So that'd be great. So I was just wondering, in terms of the population genetics, how were you considering overcoming the natural selection against whatever deleterious mutations or alleles you put in? For, for which bit, sorry? Um, if you were to continue into population genetics and possibly release a population with deleterious alleles that you want to spread, how would you consider overcoming the selection against those alleles? Yeah, so we're not, at this stage, we're not looking at any sort of releases, um, but these are being looked at in a number of other insects. Um, some mosquito releases occurred over in the US with uh, mixed, mixed reactions from people. So I think at this stage, that sort of modified release is, is a little way off um, in terms of being able to do that, but it's something that um, the candidates that we're finding uh, might be useful for. So in terms of deleterious alleles, there are ways to link them to um, other things that can help drive them through a population. 
Um, but I, I mean, I don't think that that's something that is is necessarily feasible in the short to medium term. I think maybe longer term, when people are more familiar with some of the technologies, that might be more appropriate. But it's not not something we're doing or developing at this stage. Um, the other question I had had to do with identifying the lethal genes. Um, do you ever attach a genetic switch, like a, a task to the um, to the RNA binding region of the genome? So, you know, before each gene, there's a, there's a section where the... Um, so the enhancer? Or? Yeah, that's the yeah. one, the enhancer. Sorry, I had a yeah. brain fart. So, so what we're doing at the moment is, is just knocking out the gene entirely, um, but there are other techniques that we're looking at trying to develop which do do things like allow you to look at how a gene is expressed, so where it's expressed allows you to tag it fluorescently so you can see exactly where in the cell it is, so is it getting to a place that it might be able to be targeted, um, confirm which parts of that protein are inside and outside of the cell, because again we can predict what bits of the protein might be visible uh, or on the cell surface, but then that's all often a prediction rather than a, a validation. Thank you. I'll just keep this. Well, I'll just keep this moving along because we are really into university talk here. And <laughs> for the rest of us in the room, um, is there any landholders with a quick question? We're going to have questions later on um, at the end of the session for everybody. Thanks, Ali. Uh, Trent, just explain what myasis is. I've never heard of it before. It's obviously the fly that's less prevalent in this region, but how does that affect sheep? The myasis, sorry, so yeah. the cutaneous myasis is just the fly strike. So it's actually just the, the name for the fly strike. Any more quick questions before we get to the... I just want to know the poor t university students you had selecting the flies. Like, I was one of the ones sending them down. <laughs> um, I hope you paid them. It wasn't, well, it wasn't just the university students, but, yeah, there's, we had big teams. There was quite a few. When you yeah, it would have been a big job, I imagine. We were sending a lot of flies down. Um, thank you very much, Trent, and uh, there'll be time later for questions later on as well. So, uh, just moving on to our next speaker. Um, so, our second speaker is Laura Broughton from um, Productive Livestock Systems. Laura's... I could probably turn that one off. Back onto here. Laura's um, project is um, on pregnancy scanning, which involves properties in this area, and its aim is to increase the reproduction rate of the larger properties, um, more extensive properties. So as part of my participation in this project, it was to give Laura a chance to speak at a forum, and so we're doing that today. And